Hello and welcome to Brooks TV. I'm Johnny. And I'm Rachel Milton. Coming up in this week's episode. Poetry Walk, a brand new tool, is launched for visitors of Oxford City. Students give their ideas for the mobile application competition at Oxford Brooks University. The Great Britain junior team trained for wheelchair basketball European Championship. But first, a new tool had been launched at Oxford City. It's called the Poetry Walk. The visitors can walk through Oxford City with an MP3 player and listen to poems from various poets. Let's see what it's all about, casting reports. Oxford, the city of dreaming spires, is famous the world over for its university and place in history. Every year, this ancient and modern city attracts millions of visitors and students who come for tours of the historic buildings and museums and study at the university. Now there's an audio tour of Oxford which gives visitors a brand new and a unique experience of the city's literary history. The activity is created by the Oxford Playhouse and performed by Live Cannon. Hannah Bevan, who is the assistant producer on the project, explains more about Poetry Walk. Um, and it's basically a tour of the city to poetry. Um, and it's poetry about Oxford or um, poets that have come to the university and studied here. Um, and it's a fantastic range of different poems that you can listen to while at um, the beautiful sights of Oxford City. Uh, it starts at the Playhouse and you get the MP3 and headphones from the box office and then you just walk round to your leisure then to this beautiful track of poetry. For the Poetry Walk project, they had to go through a lot of poems and pick the best and most suitable ones that show off the city. The visitors have a map to guide them on the walk. It starts from the Playhouse Theatre, down Broad Street, through university buildings and along some of the city's busiest shopping streets. Besides the audio explanation, Visitors can also hear different poems about different locations, like the St Giles Memorial by C.S. Lewis called Oxford. It is well that there are palaces of peace, and discipline, and dreaming, and desire, lest we forget our heritage and cease the Spirit's work to hunger and aspire. There are a total of 17 locations for Poetry Walk in Oxford City, including famous buildings and Oxford University campus, such as the Bridges Size, the Radcliffe Camera, St Mary's, the University Church and Clarendon Centre. Hannah also said that they hope this project can lead the visitors to know more about Oxford in a lovely way. Um, and a lot of people have said that it's very evocative, very inspiring and just a great way to see the city and especially for the first time, so new students as well, if they're just arriving in Oxford, it's a great way for them to see the city. It's you know, very non-academic and it's just really, really lovely and the students may not get the time to go on a lot of tours around the city and know exactly what the different sites and buildings are. So it's a really, really great way to do that and experience Oxford in a, in a lovely, lovely way. The project will continue all the summer until 29th of September. Whether you are a visitor or a resident, choose a day with great weather and try this new tour. You can get a cup of coffee Take a walk through gorgeous Oxford City with beautiful poetry playing in your ears. Before the summer ends, have a great date with these poets. This is Catherine Carpenter, reporting for Brooks TV. Um, to me, it all looks very interesting. Is the tour something you'd like to try, Johnny? Sure, taking a walk with a sound device sounds good. Hmm. Talking of the devices, there has been a competition running that encourages students to submit ideas for innovative new mobile phone applications. And the competition is being run as part of the Brooks program for enhancing the student experiment. Janet has a story. Brooks students have been sharing their ideas of mobile apps they want to see developed. The students who enter the best app ideas will also have a chance to win an iPad 3. The competition has been running to encourage students to submit ideas for innovative new mobile apps. The best ideas suggested will be developed into apps which students can download by next academic year. We went to find out what ideas Brooks students have. A pocket diary, one that would help you with organisation. I was thinking of innovating something that to work with the bus companies. You could uh, order a taxi from your phone and 
with your GPS, it locates where you were and the taxi came and you had a code that you give to the taxi to make sure it was the same taxi. We talked to Ting, a digital publishing student who has submitted his own idea. The app I designed for the competition is called Uniply, which will help students make most of their university life by providing three special features. According to your PIP data, this app will match you with available scholarship or available academic activities. Once you solve any task or join any activities, you will get your vouchers for a free meal or free discount for books. And the other thing of this app is its special uh, multifunction map, which will tell you a special offer of the day, like book or food, or any other events of the day. And the best thing is it tells you the current position of our Brooks bus, so you will never miss your bus. Finally, if you want to find your friend or your tutor, you can search them on this campus. The competition is being run as part of Brooks's programme for enhancing the student experience. We talked to the Pro Vice Chancellor, John Raftery, about the competition. Uh, the app competition uh, has been really exciting this year and we have more than 300 applications. We wanted to make sure that we allowed students from any faculty to apply. So what we're interested in is, is it a good idea for a mobile app? If we choose that as a prize winner, we will then pay for coding to be done uh, either by students from technology who do coding or if we haven't got enough of them we can actually buy in some specialists so we will write up the application so what the competition is really about is capturing good ideas professor john raftery is excited with a number of significant ideas that they have received from students it is believed that the new apps will have a lasting impact on those studying at the university this is janet richardson reporting for brooks tv and the price is really good, great, isn't it? Yes, it's the one I've had three. I hope I can come up with an idea brilliant enough to win that, but to be honest, my programming skills aren't quite up to scratch. <laughs> yes, indeed me too. I'd like better to buy myself a copy of C++ Dummy. In other news, the, gra in other news, the Great Britain Juniors team has been training the Wheelchair Basketball European Championship. Johnny went to find out more about the sport. Wheelchair basketball is the largest and one of the blue ribbon leading Paralympic sport. Today we are going to take a look about the Great Britain Juniors quote of wheelchair basketball. The eligibility of junior team is that the players have to be 22 years old or under. Over the past 10 years, Great Britain Juniors quote has been European champion twice in both Germany 2002 and Belgium 2004 and they were runners up at the European Championship at Turkey 2006. Stoke Mandeville Stadium is the birthplace of the Paralympics and it was a good place for the Great Britain Junior Basketball team to use for their four-day training camp. I had a chat with the coach Murphy Forden and find out more. Um, you get them in from some of them 13, 14 years old and you know you've got five, six, seven years to work with those athletes. Um, and you get to see them progress through the years and then move on to the senior squads either in the men or the women's team because it's a mix, the juniors can be mixed, men and women. Um, so it's really great to see them progress and to move on to the senior squads. Richard Sargent, one of GB Junior squad players who started wheelchair basketball from nine and joined the team from six. Richard told us some of the experiment about being in the team and the competitions. Uh, it's a great honour, obviously, playing with Great Britain, playing for your country. It's obviously a great, great achievement. Um, you know, the junior programme in this country is far beyond most people in the world now. And we see, you know, a lot of more youngsters coming through at a young age because obviously the junior team is under 23. Uh, but we see, you know, kids coming along that are 14, 15, 16 and giving that those opportunities younger. And the program's just incredible, so to be part of, part of your country and be, be part of the, uh, the development of, of becoming an elite athlete, you know, it's a, great, it's a great opportunity. Because of the limitation of the age, every year Great Britain Juniors Quo need to do some adjustment on the players and rebuilding. Coach Marvin Forden is satisfied with mix in team for the coming competition in July. I think we've got a very good mix of players. I say there's some young ones, there's a 13-year-old here and a 14-year-old. 
uh, right up to 19 year olds. So a good, good young group, good quality. We have four other players here training with the men's team at the moment. So they're involved with the men. Um, so they're, they're really progressing well and we've got a good bunch. It's hard because from, as you know, there's, it's a junior team, so we're only allowed up to 21 years old. So from different tournament to tournament, you lose several players. From the last Europeans, we lost five players of the squad. So you have to rebuild every, for every competition, uh, maybe start a fresh kind of thing. So. so future plans to have our own success, but also we want to build the players up so they can move into the senior squads, and that's where we judge our success. Uh, the, the current crop of the men's team and the women's team, how many have come through the junior setup. And as the team is under intense training in preparation for the European Wheelchair Basketball Championship to be hosted here at Stoke Mandeville City in July, they hope to do better than they have done before and progress to win the championship and qualify for the World Championship next year. Are they going to win the championship this year? We will just have to wait and see when the championship starts on 7th July. Johnny Brooks TV. Now you'll be sad to hear that you're currently watching the penultimate episode of Brooks TV for this series. Yes, there are only one more episode in the series which will be available next week. But as always, you'll still be able to watch the, every episode from this series by visiting the Brooks University YouTube page. You can find a link to it on the Brooks University homepage. Don't go there just yet though, as we only pass way through our show. Stay tuned as coming up in the next half. I talked to David Rowling about Cafe 2012, a project that will provide a safe environment for young people to enjoy the game over the summer. And we visit the Blackbird Lees Amateur Boxing Club, which is looking for a new place. Welcome back. Cafe 2012 is a project that has been created for young people in connection with the 2012 London Olympics. Earlier in the week, Johnny had a chat with Dave Rollins, the director of Aylesbury Vale Youth for Christ, about the project. Hello, Debbie. I'm so welcome today. You can come to here. So I have some question about your project now. So um, the first question is, uh, what is the what is the connection between the uh, Cafe 2012? and the 2012 Olympic M. Yeah. Well, our organisation for the last five years has been setting up youth cafes in, a, in and around Aylesbury Vale. And they attract hundreds of young people, they have lots of fun, mm -hmm. uh, they enjoy it. And because, because the Olympics is coming to London, yeah. um, other organisations, national organisations approached us and said, is there any way we can take your model of youth cafes mm -hmm. and share it with others? So during the Olympics, um, young people can watch the Olympic Games, they can have fun, they can build relationships through competition. Mm -hmm. And so we've created a website, uh, an online toolkit, with everything you need to get a youth cafe going. So mm -hmm. anyone from the country can visit the website for free, mm -hmm. um, get our ideas and templates, and set up their own youth cafe mm -hmm. to run during the Olympics. Well, it sounds really attractive. So, um, so what is the initial purpose of your project? Well, the initial purpose is really about meeting the needs in the community. Mm -hmm. um, in 2006, we did some research into the needs of youth and community in Aylesbury Vale. Yeah. And the greatest need was to find places for young people to hang out and build relationships. And so mm -hmm. uh, we started setting up youth cafes and we've, we've got about 17 going so far uh, in and around Aylesbury. And they gather hundreds of young people every week. Uh, and they mm -hmm. just have an amazing time. It's, it's for secondary school age young people, yeah. uh, 11 up to 18. Yes. And so that's where it came from. Okay. Uh, and <laughs> really the Cafe 2012 is a response to the Olympics. It's, it's to allow more young people yeah. uh, to get involved and to in, enjoy activities mm -hmm. and fun. Okay, thank you. So, um, so how about, I mean, how widespread now are the youth cafe in UK? Yes, good question. We're, in Aylesbury, we've got about 17 Aylesbury Vale, um, but across the country, uh, around 200 sites have registered 
mm -hmm. uh, to set up a youth cafe. Mm -hmm. uh, about 170 uh, are linked in with the Olympics and want to do something specific for the Olympics. And some of those are, are also wanting to go on to run something more long term. Yeah. Uh, so including Scotland, Wales, uh, we've got Land's End, mm -hmm. uh, Essex, where I'm from originally. There's, there's a bunch of places that are registered and uh, lots in London, lots in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. um, we've had even people register in France and Italy mm -hmm. and Palm Beach in America. Okay. So it really is, yeah. I mean, there's not lots all over the world, but uh, across the UK, certainly lots of places are interested. And yeah. I, think, I think it's partly because um, councils are having to pull away from doing youth work for budget reasons yeah. and so organizations like ours which are third sector charities mm -hmm. um, there's a real opportunity for us to go in and start to meet the need yeah and I think that's why people are interested and yeah. are wanting to get something going yeah actually yeah it is and um, so what, what kind of the facilities and uh, the activity that you are providing now can attract more young people joining your pro project well, most youth cafes have computer games, Nintendo Wii, PlayStation, Xbox mm -hmm. on big screens. But we have card games, we have guitars, we have um, sports activities. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in some senses, the activities that we do doesn't really matter because the kids just have fun yeah. and they build relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think another thing that attracts young people is they can participate in the project themselves. So we have lots of young people that get involved as junior volunteers, junior yeah. leaders, and I think they have a real sense of reward uh, through being involved, and because they love it and they're part of it, yeah, exactly. they invite their friends. Yeah. Um, every cafe we ask young people at the beginning and end what they'd like to do, uh, how we can make it better, yeah. and so we always have new ideas and activities coming in that they can try. Um, thanks for coming today, and good luck for your project. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. If you are interested in Cafe 2012, you can visit their website www.cafe2012.info. Elsewhere in Oxford, a new exhibition has been put on display at the Ashmolean Museum. It is called Sculpture and Sports. Sina went to find out more about this exhibition. In celebration of the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games, the public arts organizer Art at the Edge commissioned 30 bronze sculptures that are now on display here at the Ashmolean Museum. This collection has brought together the work of Britain's most established and up-and-coming sculptors who worked on different sporting disciplines. I went to the talk the creator of sculpture and sport, Alan Dunn, gave at the atrium on the introduction of the display. Now I've mentioned bronze as the key material that carries all the way through the, the collection. I should point out, for those of you who might be confused, that we are embedded among the permanent collection, so there are heads and other exhibits there. But among that, you will find that the names are our own sculptures. He explained more about some of the sculptures that are on display. This piece of sculpture by Sue Freeborough, as you can see, fencing, Apart from the very dynamic composition and the movements of the two figures, you can see that she's obviously looked at fencing. There's a lot of attention to detail. And it's almost like a piece of ballet. The project was made possible through a generous donation by the Roper Family Charitable Trust and the support of Buff and North East Somerset Council and several other Buff businesses. The sculptures are up for sale and the profits from the project will be used to support disadvantaged and disabled young people through the life-changing work of the Youth Support Trust and the British Paralympic Association. I also spoke to one of the sculptors, John Buckley, who made the Blade Runner. When somebody asks you to do something, I mean, you, 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 there is a blankness. I mean, to get the idea, you have to put in lots of drawings and uh, look at lots of things and I suppose what I was saying about the, the, the South African um, double amputee and uh, other photographs I've seen in the papers and runners and so on and uh, I suppose slowly but surely the idea develops and you, um, you, uh, you, 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 you work from there. It doesn't just happen. <laughs> you know. You have to go through a, a, a sort of process of uh, 
elimination until you get what you want. And uh, this is uh, this took uh, oh it took about a, a year from start to finish I should think to, to get to get it right. After the exhibition here at the Ashmolean on May 20, 2012, the exhibition will go to Victoria Art Gallery, Bath, May 26 to July 1st, Bloomsbury Art Fair, London, July 6 to July 8, Gallery at Oxo, London, July 31st to August 12th, 2012. This collection of sculptures shows the passion of the athletes as they compete in the different events. This passion will be something that we will have to look out as we watch the Olympic and the Paralympic Games this summer. I look forward to see the Blade Runner as I am always amazed by him. From the Ashmolean Museum, Sina Korchan reporting for Brooks TV. Next, we visit the Blackbird Lees Amateur Boxing Club in Oxford. This boxing club has been looking for a new place to call their home. Our reporter went to find out more. Blackbird Lee's Amateur Boxing Club is looking for a new place to call home after outgrowing its current home for more than 30 years in the local community centre. The boxing club trains dozens of young men and women four times a week. The appeal for a new place has received some extra support from the Oxford University boxing coach who started boxing at this club about 46 years ago when he was eight. Des Brackett spoke about the appeal. You know what I mean? But I got into the box and I did love it. it gave me a chance to dance around the ring. It gave me a chance to express um, what was inside me. I was very introvert, very shy. I had no confidence. <laughs> Believe it or not, going into a boxing gym and exerting yourself to your limits mm -hmm. and then coming out of it, there's no better drug than adrenaline. And that is what you leave the gym with. And this is why I have such a passion for the sport. This is why I have such a passion for Blackbird Lees. This is where I started. The club has given opportunity for young people in the area to get involved in sports. And as the number of people coming to train at the club is increasing, the need for a bigger space has become a priority. Even though the club is running sessions throughout the week in the community centre, the ring and other equipment have to be put up at the start and taken down at the end of each session by the coaches. This is something that can be avoided if a new building can be found where the equipment can stay up for as long as it's needed. The coach explains how they're managing at the moment. Uh, the current facilities, as you can see, are quite, quite small. So, um, <coughs> where, as we say, with that many people coming in, especially when the sessions overlap, because they overlap by about 20 minutes. So when you've got 40 people in here at one time, it's ridiculously crammed. 20 people at a time, it's just about manageable. But obviously we have to split those sessions. But if we have a larger place, we wouldn't have to split the sessions, which means we could run the whole lot in one session, which means a lot less time for coaches, a lot less time in the actual facility. So The local paper, the Oxford Mail, have taken up a campaign, which has been really good. Um, so they've been promoting it and trying to get us some new accommodation. And through that, we've already had one We've had a look at one new location, which is iKids in Greater Lees, and we're actually checking to pursue that at the moment. Although it's not much of a bigger space, it means we could keep the stuff up permanently, which means we wouldn't have to take it up and down all the time, because the ring takes about 20 minutes to half an hour to put up, and about 20 minutes to take down. So if we could go to a new facility <coughs> and keep the ring and everything up in one go, then that'd be great. Um, but So the local community have been getting behind it, but only once when in the Oxford Mail, but any more um, coverage we could get would be great. It is a good thing that the Blackbird Lees Amateur Boxing Club has outgrown its current home in the local community centre, but it still has nowhere to call home. The club is desperate to have a new home, so whether you're able to help them relocate, contribute financially, or just have a power punch of an idea that can get them a new place, please contact Tony Gibson on the number below. 07 064 And that's it for this week. You can view any of our previous episodes on the website www.btv.brooks.ac.uk And if you have any questions, you can email us via brookstv at brooks.ac.uk Thanks for watching. Goodbye and have a nice day.